Welcome to the Crypto Podcast. You can find all our episodes on thecryptopodcast.org. We're also on BitChute and YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I forward our podcast, The Awakening, Learn Polish, The Meditation, and The Speaking, as well as being a podcasting coach. You can find everything on RoyCollin.com. Today, my guest, based in the UK, please welcome Phil Blows. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. So you might let the audience know. Who's Phil? So Phil is the uh, the co-founder of a company called Accrue. We're a, uh, a listed uh, crypto business that specializes on giving people um, the highest yields on their digital assets. So customers transfer um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and sort of stable coins to us. We pay them between between 12 and 7% um, interest on those. And um, yeah, we've, we, um, we started the business about uh, 18 months ago. We've been growing at a, at a pretty crazy pace. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, we're on that kind of crazy scale up journey at the moment. So it's, uh, it's been quite the ride. So I know that you've kind of went from zero to 10,000 customers in something like four months, which is incredible. So you might tell me that journey. Yeah, so we, we had a bit of, you know, we talk about kind of overnight successes and things which often have a, a fairly large backstory and a lot of blood, sweat and tears in the background. Um, so re- really the journey started back in kind of 2020, where we identified that there was this opportunity where you could earn very, very high yields by lending out your digital assets or, you know, to, to a lot of different counterparties with, you know, a reasonable degree of risk. However, the the, the mechanism by which you did that was incredibly complicated. So I think I've come spent my career looking at how do we make sort of financial services more consumable, easier to use, safer, those sorts of things. This, this slotted quite nicely into that space. And um, having you know, done some testing with friends and family, you know, we launched the business, we raised money very quickly and actually listed as a public company very quickly. So did what's called a SPAC. Um, and in the process, kind of raised 11 million in the first 10 months of the business. Um, and, um, you know, we, we kind of just hit a really real sweet spot. We designed a product that customers love. We had a good marketing um, and go to market strategy. And really what that meant was you know, once we got our first few hundred customers, they referred hundreds who refu- referred hundreds. And that's kind of why we've, you know, with all that kind of work in the background, that's how we've then ended up with this amazing kind of growth, growth rate. And, uh, you know, we're kind of still growing around about 100% a month. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of just hit a real, a real need right now in a, in a world where there's nowhere to get yield on any assets. And uh, crypto is a hot space as well as, as well as that. So it seems to have just ticked a lot of boxes for a lot of investors, both, both retail and institutional. Excellent. And that's an incredible growth that you're getting. And I know that you, when somebody opens up, you're giving something like $10 and then there's kind of like a referral system, which I'm sure, obviously, it has to be worth your while because you've looked at the true value of a customer. And, you know, you know that obviously you can get some people just take the small amount and just base it on that, but they, they've worked. So like that's kind of the marketing strategy. That's the main, main thing for you, basically. Yeah, yeah the, the $10 was quite important, I think. And I was trying, we, what we wanted to do with the user's experience was make it as easy as possible for them to see how the app worked. So the, the idea was, is that you only need like your, an email and a password. And, um, you know, what that means is you then, you land on the app and instantly you can see we've invested kind of $10 into our stablecoin product for you. So immediately having logged in, you can see that your money is kind of earning in real time and your $10 balance is increasing in real time. And I think you know, that, that was very much designed to kind of give the, the user the ability just to play around with the tool from, from day one. And also to have, have a bit more confidence to see the mechanism because what, what we wanted to avoid was, was, was users testing us out with $10. It's almost actually operationally more efficient for us just to give them $10 and you know, let them play around than it is to have them put $10 in and then, and then scale up for their second deposit. So the kind of behavior we've seen that that's encouraged is people, you know, they get familiar because they can see how it works with the first $10. And then they just, you know, they let it, um, you know, their, their second deposit then is much larger. Um, and, you know, obviously incentivizing people to refer customers is, has always been a good, a good strategy. I and mean, we've built a great community. You know, we've, you know, we've got probably 20,000 customers across our social channels now who are really, really active in terms of providing feedback. So we learn a lot from customers. 
and we'll continue to do so i think with uh with the kind of feedback that we're getting and the growth that we're seeing excellent and with with this system then because obviously if you log money in can you do it with like debit credit card or must you use a wallet system because i mean i'm i'm just learning that it's hard to kind of educate people you know there's the fair factor obviously there's the people that understand the crypto but there's a lot that don't what way does mm -hmm. your system work do you have to have a wallet so yeah it's, it's a really good point because for most people you know the idea of having and this was goes back to that initial kind of founding idea the idea that you would you have to have your own wallet and connect it into the crypto system before you can get started you know discounts a huge proportion of the population you know probably the probably 90 odd percent of people and you know, having come from traditional finance, I know how hard it is to get people to engage with traditional investment platforms, let alone investment platforms in crypto. So it's really important from day one to provide you know, ways of getting normal money onto the platform. So you can anyone on anyone can deposit euros or GBP and other currencies coming um, either via a bank deposit, which is completely free, um, and then convert that into crypto again, we, which is completely free. We don't there's no transaction cost for that. Um, or they can use a debit card. And, um, you know, one thing I'd say about the debit card route at the moment is it's more expensive. So it's on the platform, but we are working with a lot of providers to try and get the cost down because the way it works is you deposit um, you know, your normal currency, but you, you purchase it and then we get delivered the, um, the crypto on the other side. But, you know, it can probably turn out to be around sort of 4% or so as, as a fee, which... Um, you know, so we really encourage people to use the bank transfer feature because it's you know, your bank's not charging you anything on the whole and we're not charging you anything. You know, we don't make any money out of the card payments either. It's, it's all, all our suppliers, but they're just, as it happens at the moment, there's no really efficient way to get card payments onto, onto crypto platforms without, without there being quite a lot of cost. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully people are comfortable with the, with the banking bank transfer solution, which... Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of volume through that channel. So hopefully it, it, that, that's showing that customers are comfortable doing it. And it's kind of, you know, the blockchain technology and the crypto that I would love to see more using because, you know, you mentioned about the fees they charge. Most of them, Visa, MasterCard, even PayPal sometimes is like 7% they're taking. They're fleecing yeah. people. And Absolutely. I like, I was talking to somebody the other day, they were on about doing, some guy had done a billion dollar transaction with Bitcoin and it was something like two bucks or something. It was very, yeah. you know, it, that is unreal. And I remember talking to somebody years ago, asked him, he was the main dealer for a Ferrari. And I was like, are they taking 3% of that? And it was like, yeah. And I was like, you know, that's and unbelievable that they've got away with that for so many years. Well, I mean, if you look at if you look at the main the main card providers, you know, they've got um, it's increased over time. Their profit margins are increasing over time as they're kind of getting more of that. Um, I guess that they've, they've got greater market share. They've, it's, it's higher barriers to entry in that traditional finance space. But they're, they're looking at 30, 40 percent um, profit margins on their entire business, you know, which is why they're, they're such valuable companies. And they've, you know, they've built amazing businesses. But, you know, it's it's a cost, you know, a, a transaction cost is almost friction on day-to-day -day commerce. So trying to reduce that is really important. You know, the value of a lot of these payment businesses is basically value that's been taken away from small businesses. Um, and, you know, value that's been taken away from consumers getting good, good returns on their, their investment. So it's, it's really important to have a, a fairer and you know, less centralized economic system that we reduce this sort of transactional friction. And as you mentioned, it's a great example. Yeah, you, I, I could send you a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Do in, please. In, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> if I had it, you know, I'd, uh, I'd be, I'd be doing this from, from the Bahamas probably. But um, you know, it's um, but it would cost, as you say, a couple of dollars. It would take five min, five minutes probably to, to get over to you, which isn't ideal. You know, we want it to be instant. And there are other blockchains outside of Bitcoin where it's a lot more instantaneous the, the transactions. Um. But yeah, it's it's a more efficient way of moving value around the uh, the um, you know the world and you know the time zones. And one thing we don't you know we don't talk about is if I was sending money from well to be honest from the UK to Poland, you know at the moment you'd probably use a provider who makes the journey a lot smoother by sort of leveraging their balance sheet. And it probably would look fairly instantaneous. But what's actually happening in the background is you know you're going through kind of swift mechanisms and things like that, which are taking days to transact. 
because a lot of banking infrastructure is on this really legacy, you know, old tech. So again, blockchain tech, and that's one area we talk about crypto, but it's actually the technology that's un that underpins it, you know, has the ability to make the financial system so much more, you know, scalable and efficient if, if we can, you know, get, get larger institutions to start adopting it. Uh, but it's brilliant that you're actually, you know, you're trying to save people money because it's amazing to me the amount of people that actually aren't aware of the fees that some of them are charged. Even say the likes of Ryanair and Amazon and all that, they'll kind of, you know, they'll allow you to use their currency provider. And if you actually check the, the rates, they're they're fleecing people. Yeah. And I, I think it comes back. I, I spent four years at a um at, a, at another fintech. And um what we were building there was Kind of software to try and help people better manage their their day-to-day -day finances and then hopefully get them from the position of being in debt to you know actually saving money and you know planning for retirement and that sort of thing and really trying to improve the financial well-being you know of of people and you know as part of that project i actually ran around the uk probably spoke to around about ten thousand people over four years when i was just taking them through the tool and showing them what it was and sort of talking them through the results and um yeah, it, it was a massive eye opener, you know, first of all, around how disengaged most people are in their finances and don't really you know, don't pay attention to these small fees, which really build up. But also, like depressingly, just how bad a situation most people are in with their money. You know, the average pension pot at the point of retirement in the UK is something around 60,000 pounds. You know, you're talking about retirement incomes of like 10,000 pounds. You know, it's like it's just it's just not gonna you know a lot of people will never be able to stop working you know the younger generation is kind of pretty 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 disengaged from traditional finance which is actually why they're moving to things like crypto and nfts and things like that to look for you know more exciting returns um so yeah it's it's you know the the it, it's it's a against a slightly depressing landscape people need to engage more with their finances and i think that's why we're seeing so much interest in kind of you know alternative asset classes now because people are people are getting tired of you know being fleeced of of not getting the returns thereafter and you know feeling kind of you know, cut off or cut or, or or sort of excluded from the traditional sort of savings world yeah and I, like i know that with the pension because when i was working in ireland you know it was i had full contribution and you get this report basically telling you when it goes up 6%, it'll be worth this. When it goes up 8%, it'll be worth this. And every year it's the same amount and it's still telling you the same thing. And sometimes it goes down, even when the markets are going through the roof, it's like it might go up a small bit. And I've talked to some people that have big funds and it's kind of the same. That seems to be the same in most countries. Is that something because like the, the interest rates that you're providing, I think they from just what I've looked at, it's kind of 7 to 12%. If I could get 12% on my pension fund, I would be so happy. Is that something that is possible? At the, at the moment, no. So, I mean, the way you know, pension assets are, are generally, you know, um, ring fenced in terms of what they can invest in. So traditional kind of securities, stocks, bonds, uh, that sort of thing. Obviously, bonds at the moment, and most people, you know, are unaware of what their pensions is invested in. And 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 by default there will be a default selection which will generally put you in sort of 50 well say depending on your age 25 to 30 percent bonds and the rest in equities and um, at the moment the 25 to 30 percent that's sitting in bonds is probably losing you eight percent a year to inflation and you know what you put into equity depending on what what it's in is also probably not performing very well so You've got these, um, you know, long term. Hopefully that changes, but you know, obviously over the last you know few years, that's not been it's not been a good portfolio to really be in. It hasn't really provided much growth. So, um, you know, I think there's a big push to be able to invest in digital assets through your pension, and indeed there are options which you can look at. So there are things like Bitcoin ETFs or um, you know, these sorts of things where they are. In exchange traded securities, which means that if the the platform that your pension provider is with, um, you know, will it will allow the selection, you can legally invest your pension into these sorts of products, which will, you know, they'll mirror the price of Bitcoin, uh, albeit in quite an expensive way. So, um, unfortunately, at the moment, there's no yield product that's really available in 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 a kind of a tax efficient wrapper like a pension or an ISA in the UK. But um, yeah, hopefully, it's coming.
And, um, you know, we're, we, we want to be on the forefront of that because, you know, we're, we're looking at solutions that are bringing the, you know, the world of decentralized finance, the world of yield generation to the everyday consumer and, you know, doing it in a safe and sustainable way. So hopefully that will, you know, that will feed through pretty quickly. Oh, that'd be great if that happened. And I, I see that you use MoonPay. I haven't heard about that. You might explain a bit about that. So MoonPay are a are one of these card providers that I mentioned um, who, you know, effectively you use them to, if someone wants to pay on a credit card with our account in sort of any of, you know, a lot of different currencies, um, they can, you know, they do the card, they do a card process. Uh, so they'll, you know, they put in their card details. Um, they then, you know, select which, which crypto they want to send to a crew. So what it'll probably be is, you know, just say I've got US dollars, I want to invest in Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin then eventually gets added to their, their accrue account. So it's another, it's this alternative provider, which allows everything to happen via, via a card. You know, the only downside to that is the cost, um, but obviously it gives you a lot of flexibility. So if you're coming from a country where, which we don't host or we don't support the, um, you know, the underlying currency, then um, obviously it's a good, it's a good option to have. Um, but it's to say it is expensive, but hopefully these costs are coming down as a lot more providers are entering the space. Uh, you know, fees that we've talked about being expensive often, you know, they are expensive, but they're not as expensive as what we see in, you know, in, in kind of traditional, um, but in non-traditional sort of uh, card providers. So um, as they enter the market, as they are, you know, hopefully that will, that will bring costs down for the consumer. Okay, excellent. And just for you know, you mentioned companies. So I think you're originally UK based, but uh, I see you've got something in Bulgaria and have you something in Lithuania as well? So yeah, in, in terms of how our company is structured, you know, we are a, you know, a publicly listed company in the UK trading on, on the Aquis Exchange. And um, you know, that, that's effectively our, our we, we are a big incubator of businesses. So we've invested in, in nine businesses and um, you know, seven of which are in kind of the DeFi space that we have a partial stake in, two of which are wholly owned. And you know, one of those wholly owned businesses is, is a crew. And um, you know, that is based out of, um, out of either Bulgaria or Lithuania, depending on the region that you're, you're transacting from. And the reason for that is we've got authorization in those two territories to, to, to be a, you know, a licensed crypto business or a, what's called a VASP or a virtual asset services provider. And uh, you know, that, that's where the kind of regulatory hub is for each one of, for, for that accrue business. Um, you know, so we are talking to the regulators in the UK to try and continually add you know, more jurisdictions. Um, and also in Ireland, uh, we have a FinTrack license in Canada as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we're constantly looking and speaking to a lot of different regulators globally, try and have a very robust sort of reg regulatory footprint for the whole business, because um, you know, it's, an it's an emerging market in terms of or asset class. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of regulatory asymmetry around the globe. And really what we need to do as a business is try and just you know, do whatever we can to engage with regulators in a sensible way to make sure that they're, they're kind of supporting our business. Um, but yeah, on top of that as well, we've got a great team, customer service team in Bulgaria. So a lot of crypto businesses set up businesses there. So you've got this enormous pool of really, really well-educated, incredibly crypto savvy individuals who you know, are, are great employees that we can hire. And, um, if you ever download our app, you'll, you know, there'll be an intercom there and just, just ask a question. They're there to educate, to help and to answer any questions. And yeah, we get amazing feedback on them because they're, you know, they're, they're such a, they're such a proactive and, uh, and helpful team. Excellent. And, you know, you mentioned about the regulation, you know, like if you've got money in a bank, it, I think depending on the country, I think in Ireland and most of them, it's like, say, 100,000 euro that you're protected. So, you know, if you're looking at the bigger, so obviously the small investors, it's not going to matter. So one, is there a limit to the amount you can invest in your system? And two, for the bigger buys, how much is there a protection? So yeah, it's uh, it's a really good question. We um in terms of the upper limit, there isn't one. You know, we have some very very big investors. Um, you know, both both institutional and retail. Um, in terms of the you know protection in in the world of crypto, it's a little bit different. So, what you're what you're really your biggest exposure is that the assets are are effectively hacked and stolen. You know, and you you hear you read about these hacks that happen. And, um, you know, rewind to kind of, you know, 2008, the, the original, um, you know, time when, when, when Bitcoin was first mined and it was really a very, very kind of tech focused community of, um, you know, of developers who, 
it, that you needed to be a developer in order to safely safeguard your assets um, because it was it was kind of the wild west. Um, you know, nowadays what we have is you know we, we use a company called Fireblocks. They are kind of a bank level um, custody and wallet provider. So all the assets that we have are stored in Fireblocks, and um, you know they have a thirty million dollar insurance policy attached to them against hacking. And uh, you know they've done over two trillion dollars worth of, of uh, digital asset transfers, and you know they're they're a pretty tried and tested um, you know platform in the space. I mean, dealt with um, you know dozens of banks and, and other kind of big providers such as ourselves. So um, you know that that's one of our main concerns is how do we build the most robust, secure platform for storing digital assets? And we you know we've we've done that in conjunction with Fireblocks, and and through the other security measures that we've taken. So um, yeah, we have insurance, and it's uh, you know it's obviously a very useful thing to have. And um, I think you know we that that's given a lot of our current institutional customers a lot of a lot of um, faith in the business, and they're, they're happy to place pretty pretty large and significant sums of assets with us on the back of that. Excellent. And like I've seen the different uh, you've the stable coins. Is have you plans for kind of bringing in other coins because it's like Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, like. I mean, this, I don't know how many at this stage, 8,000 or something like that. But have you a system for kind of vetting and making sure that it's, you know, it works in, the, in your system? Yeah. So, I mean, I, what, what's really, you know, having spoken about that kind of experience previously around sort of doing the research on the everyday, everyday user, I look at, I look at the, you know, the number one, earn, you know, the top paid executive in the UK last year worked for a gaming company, right? Who's only makes money when, gamblers lose money you know and which is not a, having a positive impact on the, the financial health of the workforce and the majority of trading platforms that you see have to have a disclaimer at the bottom saying look 80 odd percent of customers lose money or lose their entire account balance within kind of three months all these horrible risk ones because you know they are providing a product that's kind of detrimental to overall financial health yeah my number one priority is, you know, we talk about safety, but it's like the safety of the customer and providing a service that is going to make them wealthier. That's what I'm, that, so everything we're doing, we, so you so much we can do if, you know, the price of Bitcoin collapses, then, you know, that's sort of out of our control. But, you know, everything we're doing is around trying to tip the balance in favor of the customer. You know, so we're trying not to get you know, customers trading because we know people who trade, they buy the top, they sell the bottom, you know, it's panic and greed, it's the usual stuff. So, you know, we're looking for longer term crypto investors. And, you know, the long answer to you, so this is sort of the long answer to your question, which is, you know, what we need to do is have ultimate faith in the, any asset that we put onto the platform. And it's like, so we are going through an amazing, you know, amount of vetting of any asset. And yeah, I want to be able to say that I believe any asset on our platform is still going to be here in five, 10, 15 years. You know, and at the moment you've got Bitcoin and Ethereum and, you know, the stable coins, they are there that I think they've got a, you know, a great track record and they've got a great future ahead of them. It's just looking at what's the next one. And, you know, that's, that's more difficult than you would have thought. But, you know, that's not to say there's some amazing pro pro projects out there that we're really keen to list. Um, so it might be that there is a way of can we can we maybe have an institutional offering which uses more coins in the short term, and then you know, depending on how that goes, roll them out to, to retail investors. Because I'm just aware that because we've taken this very simplistic approach to the you know to make a simple, easy to understand product, we've probably attracted a more sort of uh, you know a less experienced crypto investor. So we need to protect them. And, you know, I think one way of protecting them is to make sure the assets that we, we hold are slightly, slightly more limited than you get on other exchanges. Um, because every, every other exchange, they'll have hundreds of assets because they make their money out of you buying and selling all as, as aggressively as you possibly can. That's not our business model. We take a percentage of the yield that's generated for our customers. And, you know, so we make money when our customers make money. And so I, I want to keep it that way. I want to keep our, you know, our, interest, our interest aligned with our customers. And yeah, you know, be very much, you know, on their side. Yeah, no, I, I love that model because I know of, um, other systems and they're best. Yeah, as you say, when they're doing the trade, you know, they're giving X amount. I I I know of one person and basically they were just constantly trading and showing the person's money was going on based on the market and they were making a fortune. And you know, you have to have ethics. And I mean, 
like I just looked at a few videos with your thing and I look at the different people in, involved in the company and I think you can kind of pick up on the energy and you can see the people and even just listening to you talking about the people in Bulgaria it's kind of you care and you're you're aware of this most of them out there are out to kind of take the money out of your pocket instead of a win-win situation because obviously you're making a percentage as well which is great and you know it's in your interest to give as much as possible because then people will invest more and they'll tell 10 of their friends and i love that model to be honest which i think it's fantastic it, it, that's it it's a longer term focus like you know we've obviously there's been some amazingly successful exchanges that are out there but it's like i just i've, I've seen it all before you know i haven't got too many gray hairs but I, I do know enough that like you know it's i've seen people lose millions of pounds trying to trade the markets and it's such a small percentage of people who do it consistently well that you know the majority of people it's like it's better generally buy and buy and hold or dollar cost average you know, investments over the long term is the the way most people make money and actually outperform most traders and most professional fund managers so it's like just by doing the basics right you are you're beating 99 percent of people so that's you know everything that we're doing we're trying to encourage that kind of activity excellent and just curious about like say nfts because i'm really uh researching at the moment i'm actually setting up something like that is that something that you're looking at or are you staying away from that well i i think nfts are really interesting and um, you know, there's a huge um, there's a huge market that's exploding in the space. You know, I think what it's it's I you compare it to like the early days of, of crypto of the you know, traditional cryptocurrency in that you know what what it is now probably isn't what it's going to be in five ten years. So we'll see how it develops. But you know what I'm I'm really interested in in how the technology can be used and like the 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 concept of kind of fractionalized ownership. So when you think about the sort of thing it does, I mean. The example I always use is just imagine you, you know, you're a wealthy investor and you've got a Monet painting sitting on a wall somewhere, you know, and you've decided, look, I don't want to sell it particularly, but I'd, I'd kind of like rent it out for a bit, you know, and uh, maybe use it for something. So you could take that Monet and you could effectively fractionalize it, you know, turn it into 10,000 NFTs, which you could then say to the market, well, I've got this NFT now, 10,000 NFTs, and you can either lend them to people or sell them to people. Uh, or you could say, look, I will lodge these with you as collateral and you can borrow against it. So all of a sudden you've you know, still got the picture on your wall, but you've released a load of collateral, a load of sort of value into the system, which you can kind of borrow against that. that so all of a sudden that, you know, that Monet painting that maybe is, you, you know, you hope is gonna appreciate over time, suddenly is able to generate yield and you know, it becomes a more productive asset. You could have literally anything, you know, whether it's you know, houses or, you know, I found a friend of mine do it with racehorses, um, you know, real world racehorses. He took took 10 racehorses and fractionalized them and sold them and you know, removed a lot of the, the admin around owning a racehorse, um, mm. which was a fascinating way of doing it. And, you know, it's this, this is these kind of new markets that are going to come out of that, that kind of changing the way we own and, you know, prove ownership in products. I think that's going to be amazing. And, you know, as a business that is on the forefront of, you know, how do we generate yield on digital assets? You know, and I think the team that we have in place is probably one of the best teams in the world at generating yield on digital assets. And we're going to continue to resource the team and, you know, um, hire people who, who fulfill that objective. So I have no doubt that NFTs will play a big part in that strategy in the future. Excellent. And I see you're a certified blockchain expert by the Blockchain Council, which sounds impressive. I've never come across it before, so you might let me know. <laughs> First of all, who's the council and how do they make you an expert? Well, I think it's, it's really just a case of, you know, there, there's a lot of looking for kind of you know, regulatory bodies within the space. And there are you know, a number of kind of organizations, really, and less, fewer kind of regulatory councils trying to have a benchmarking standard that you need to go through so you know really that all that is is a you know it's a it's a sort of a, a couple like a month long um sort of exam and sort of um lecturing sort of um process that you go through and have an exam you have multiple exams throughout the process if you pass them to a certain level you, you get the you know the, the qualification as you would with anything else um I think, you know, we're always, there's always a, 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 you know, there's a lot of like legitimizing and kind of standardization that's probably needed in digital assets. Um, you know, how do we, how do we ensure the counterparties, if they're going to be decentralized, that's, that's fine. You know, and we don't necessarily know who they are or who owns them, but 
you know, how do we know they are up to par? You know, so there's some great auditors in the business, companies like QuantStamp, that, you know, will they give they give a lot of these DeFi companies their stamp of approval, having reviewed the code base and things like that. You know, and there's more of those. Is there something we can do? You know, that that's for code. What about operational or the team that sits behind it? You know, are there kind of decentralized ways of, of validating that people are who they are and that, you know, are going to do what they say they're going to do? And I think that that's another area of, of the market that we're going to see a lot of growth in. Excellent. And just uh, like with wallets and exchanges, which ones would you recommend? Now, it's not, it's not an easy answer because there's this big thing around, you know, not your keys, not your coins, which is like, as in, if it's not a wallet where you own the, you know, the, the secret phrases, then, you know, it belongs to an exchange. And that, that's absolutely true. But at the same time, you know, the majority of hacks that happened last year or the majority of the money that went missing last year happened from, um, you know, sort of dApps or decentralized apps around the world. You know, they didn't come from exchanges. Um, so the people who kind of put money into those, app, into those apps were the ones who had a wallet and connected that wallet to these decentralized apps. So I think what how the market has moved on, as I said, I can understand that not your keys, not your coins concept, you know, five years ago when, you know, a lot of exchanges were being hacked. You didn't, you know, the, it was a bit still the wild west. But now when you've got, you know, exchange accrue is a listed is listed is owned by a listed business. You know who, who runs the company. You know it's got good operational standards. We use Fireblocks, which is an insurance policy on the wallets. You have none of that if you use your own wallet. You know, you are completely in charge of the security yourself. And most people don't take that very seriously. You know, so they don't use a, you know, a hardware wallet to sort of like, you know, put an extra layer of code on, say, a MetaMask, um, extra layer of security, sorry, on a, on a MetaMask wallet. So I think for that reason, you know, it's like if you're doing if you're doing the self custody element yourself and you're doing it properly, great. Most people aren't. Most people are really open themselves up to loads of risks. So I think for the vast majority, they should go with an exchange because it's easier and you're basically relying on on the exchange's operations and infrastructure. Okay. And I know you're an author as well, uh, the Money Triangle, and I believe you're put the, the proceeds were going to charity. Yeah, so it's a you know, the Money Triangle has been a book. It was a book I wrote on the back of that kind of tour of the UK, which is you know, just trying to condense all of the learnings from speaking to people into into like a coherent structure. And really, it was just breaking down people's finances into you know their spending habits, their uh, their saving habits, but then also like you know how to get them just to earn that a little bit more. Um, because really, it's only, without without those three imbalances, you, you know, financial health is is a bit of a pipe dream. So, um, you know, it's just just giving some really nice, you know, what we what I tried to do is was was bring out stories from people, you know, so in, in kind of the savings sector, there's section there's there's a story about, you know, Walmart employees who managed to, you know, become millionaires based on just their own stock pro program living pretty much on minimum wage, just above minimum wage. And, um, you know, on the spending it looking at kind of like lottery winners who blew it all and, you know, lessons to be learned there and. Yeah, I believe um, it's eighty percent. Is it, or that when the lottery end up going bankrupt? Wouldn't surprise me. You know, it's a really, it's a really fascinating. And I actually know someone who's aiming to do a podcast in that space was, you know, to do the the what lottery winner plus five years, and just try and find every lottery winner five years later to see how they're doing, and interesting. interview them. Yeah, um, I'm an not sure we actually kicked it off, but. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. You know, these big kind of life events have have pretty unforeseen consequences, and you know, don't don't often lead to you know the kind of happiness that that people might think. You know, it's um, it's an interesting, an interesting sort of life event that one. And the proceeds, uh, the profits yeah, so, are going to charity. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a financial education charity. So a company called Red Start, who does a lot of uh, financial education in schools and things like that. Um, you know, we we put money into that and. Um, you know, just try and make sure that, you know, any other kind of decent charities get support as when we see them, um, you know, because it's it a lot of financial habits are learned sort of before the age of like 13. So and even younger. So, you know, the younger you can get people to think about saving and, you know, and, and not just frivolous spending, the better. So, you know, trying to trying to effectively put, put classes in place that, that enable that to happen.
Excellent. And uh, yeah, I know that uh, the adults need to be paying attention because most of them, if you have your money in the bank, it's probably losing money. If you're lucky to, you know, 0.1 of a percent, but when you take inflation in, into account, it's uh, you're in the negative. Yeah. So, I mean, like at the end of the day, what you're doing is I, I i love it to be honest with you because and you can it's actually it's accrued daily yeah it's not a case of you put the money in and you can't take it out for six months or something like that it's like i can take it out again tomorrow if i want exactly to. that yeah take it out whenever, whenever you want it's, and, that, that was the idea make it as flexible as you can yeah. and i know from loads of investments that i've done over the years and just investigating loads I did most of them they try to tie you into something so that yeah. your money and nobody knows there's hiccups along the road something can happen and it's great to know that you can actually take it out so I think what you're doing is excellent thank thank you very much thank you See, appreciate that so Phil you might let people know how they can get in contact with you so I mean probably the best way is I mean accrue.io aqru.io um we're obviously on the app store and android store as well um, you know, all of the questions you ask the customer service team via the app is, um, you know, I, I get asked and I, I review regularly, you know, staying, staying in touch with investors and, and customers is, is one of the most important jobs I have and, you know, responding to their, their queries and, you know, their, what they need us to do next. Um, I'm on LinkedIn a lot as well. So, um, you know, Philip Blows there or Phil Blows, I think I'm there. Um, you know, just reach out. Any questions, feedback, again, love to hear it. And uh, I, I get quite a lot of people contact me directly. Um, two of which actually ended up working for us. So yeah, there's um, you know, like um, yeah, love 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 hearing from people directly. So um, yeah, please please reach out. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and I'll make sure I put the links both on the audio and the video. So thank you very much, Phil. Appreciate. It. Thanks so much, Roy. Um, so that's all for the crypto podcast. You'll find all the episodes on the cryptopodcast.org. As mentioned, we're on BitChute and YouTube. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating, subscribe. It all helps. Until next week, take care.